I'm Rob Taylor. I'm from partly from this school, but also mechanical engineering. Um, and we have a visitor here who got a, uh, a like an internal seed funding to support her study, uh, and she's here for one month. I guess, yeah. um, to work on some optics stuff in collaboration with the Mechanical Engineering School and the School of Photovoltaics and Renewable Energy. She's from the, the University of Exeter, Cornwall ca campus, yeah. um, <laughs> and I guess finished your PhD uh, two years ago. Now two I think. years ago, yeah. so she's been a, a postdoc and continued to work on, on things related and, and probably expanding her uh, yeah, portfolio and <laughs> diversifying into some different areas. Um, yeah. So with that, I'll, I'll let her take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Katie Shanks. Uh, I uh, work at the University of Exeter. Um, these are some uh, images of some of the research that I do. Uh, I'll explain them later, uh, so some of them might seem a bit odd, um, but we'll get into that. Um, the uh, University of Exeter Cornwall campus, uh, just in case you thought it was close to anywhere um, <laughs> is actually very very far southwest of the UK um, and it's the Cornwall campus not the Exeter campus so it's even further two hours southwest um, so it's very far from anywhere um, but uh, it has very nice uh, coastlines and villages because of that um, so a little overview of what I'll be presenting on so I don't know uh, some of you might not be very familiar with solar concentrators, so I'll, I'll briefly say what they are and the types of them. Uh, and then I'll say what the, the main kind of advantage of solar concentrators, which is their, their the efficiency that they can increase for solar cells. Uh, and then I'll say about the optics, which is really what I uh, specialise in, but I won't go into too much detail on the, the theory of the optics. Uh, and but I will talk about my research or some of the stuff that I'm involved in. Uh, and then the kind of the challenges of CPV and their progress uh, throughout the years and what they might be doing in the future. Uh, and then obviously what I'm doing here at UNSW. Um, so briefly, um, very simple description of solar concentrators. They are uh, optics plus solar panels or solar cells. So. You can think of them simply as a magnifying glass uh, or a curved mirror. So you just have a solar cell in the focal area, or you could have a thermal uh, heating element that you could heat and use the obviously the thermal energy afterwards. Um, yeah, and they can be they can be very simple designs. So the simplest image that I could find online was that solar panel with the mirror next to it. So anything that increases the sunlight onto the solar cells or the solar panel. Um, so we're going to dive straight in with uh, one of the main types of solar concentrators, which is called a Fresnel lens. So uh, if you imagine a magnifying glass, a uh, magnifying lens, um, let's see if I can use this mouse better. Uh, yeah, so you've got the magnifying glass or lens, which uh, the Fresnel lens is just a truncated version of that. So uh, the curve of the lens is what really causes the... Uh, the concentration, the refraction. So they've just used that curve and truncated it all down so it's thinner. And that way you have less absorption and it's lighter and easier to use. Um, and these uh, optics were first used in lighthouses. And they're still used in lighthouses. Um, but that was the kind of mm, one of the, I'll describe it later, but one of the kind of breakthroughs for CPV research was definitely the use of Fresnel lenses with uh, PMMA. So a really lightweight uh, optic was developed. Uh, the Casa Green uh, uses reflective optics. So you have a, a primary reflector, uh, which uh, concentrates the light to a secondary dish reflector. And then sometimes, not always, it goes to a third optic, which uh, helps the light focus onto a small solar cell. Uh, nice and uniformly lit so that it behaves well. Uh, and the Fresnel lens and the Casa Green are both examples of high concentration optics typically. So that just means they deal with smaller solar cells and bigger optics. Uh, so you've got more concentration going on, um, more intensity on the, in the solar cell. But you can have low concentration optics. Uh, these, are, um, these are a bit 
more advantageous at uh, uh, tracking the sun, so you don't need necessarily need them to track the sun. They have a high acceptance angle, which means that they can accept a lot of the rays from the sun uh, throughout the day. Um, and these are some examples of the designs that you could have. So the most common one is called a, a CPC. So that's just got a very uh, clever curve to it, which allows the most light uh, to hit the solar cell. Uh, but you can have any kind of funnel shape that will help direct the light down to the cell. And uh, this image here is of um, one of my colleagues in the University of Exeter. He's developing solar bricks. Uh, so these would be glass walls where you'd have these low concentration optics that uh, concentrate the light onto the solar cell by, say, two or three times, uh, but also obviously let a lot of light through to whichever building it's, it's uh, attached onto. Um, yeah, so I've, I've already used some terms. Um, solar concentrators can be described in lots of ways. Uh, one of the ways uh, is the concentration ratio. So we've got low, medium, high, and uh, very recently we've got ultra high. So it's going to very high concentrations of 2,000 or more suns. Uh, the term suns just means the equivalent of uh, so if you're if you've got a solar panel out in the in the outside right now you'd have one sun but if you have optics then you're obviously increasing the number of uh, sunlight onto it so it's one sun two sun etc etc and um, it's just one of the terms that's used uh, you can also describe uh, the optics so you've got your Cassegrain Fresnel uh, and there's also something called a luminescent solar concentrator so these ones are quite uh, pleasing to look at. They have a material inside a transparent plane, so say a plastic with this absorbing material which then uh, emits in a different wavelength which gives these kind of nice colours at the edges. Uh, so the idea is you could have windows with solar cells around the edges and you'd have light going to the solar cells and then also going through. Uh, so that's one type. Uh, you can also describe uh, solar concentrators as uh, 2D or 3D, uh, and that's really talking about um, whether they're linear or point focused. So uh, linear systems like the bottom right corner is, um, is more for solar thermal, because obviously it's easier to have a pipe running along the, the focal line uh, and have your heating element going through there. Um, but it also obviously uh, dictates the type of tracking they have, so whether they track on one axis or two axes. Um, and and uh, solar concentrators, so if they're high concentration, uh, they typically need to track, but if they're low concentration, they can be stationary or even quasi-static, so they would only move a couple of times in a day or a month or even a year. Um, these are some more images of types of solar concentrators. So. There's quite a lot of designs. Um, the so some of these are that's a cast of green, for example, on the top left, uh, and you've got the Fresnel lens, and you've got lots of little small variations to designs as well, because there hasn't really been an optimum design yet, even for one particular type, there hasn't been an optimum uh, scaling or parameters. Um, uh, but the main advantage of concentrator uh, photovoltaics is their efficiency. So uh, they can increase the efficiency of solar cells uh, substantially. Uh, so for example, uh, here you have so the, the efficiency limit of a silicon, a, sing a, single, cell, a single junction solar cell uh, is around about 33% under one sun. And if you increase the concentration, you can increase the efficiency limit. Um, the theoretical maximum being this ridiculous concentration of 46,000 suns, uh, but it would push it up to 45%. And then if you uh, have a multi-junction source cell, obviously, uh, it can uh, go up to about 66% under one sun. And again, with uh, the maximum concentration feasible, but probably not ever practically achieved uh, as the uh, more the ther 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 
thermodynamic limit, which is into the 90s. But that's, these are very theoretical maximum limits, so these wouldn't practically be achieved, but it just shows the advantage of having CPB. So more concentration, you can get more efficiency, or more junctions in a solar cell, more efficiency. Uh, this is a graph of the record cell efficiencies to just kind of highlight that effect. So the uh, highest record solar cell efficiencies uh, are all kind of under con concentration. So at the moment the highest is 46% uh, uh, under uh, concentration of about, I think it's 200 or 300 X. Um, and this is the same for every type of uh, solar cell. So, uh, We've got the triple junction is the top, and then uh, double junctions, that second circle, and even single junction solar cells, and even thin film solar cells. So the, the maximum efficiency record so far has all been under concentration. So that's just to emphasise that point. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the optics. Um, so the main... Uh, the main uh, properties that we play around with is uh, refraction, reflection, and some people do use the uh, light, dis the wavelength dispersion there um, to split up the different wavelengths for the specific silicon cells, uh, solar cells that they're using. Um, there's, uh, whenever designing the optics for the solar cells, though, you have to be careful with losses. So, if the optic has got a rough surface or uh, manufactured with a lot of flaws then you're going to have a lower optical efficiency which will result in a, a lower overall efficiency and then you don't really get the advantages of using a multi-junction solar cell for example. Uh, so that's, that's just some images showing that. Uh, those pictures to show kind of the effect of uh, a field of view so if you have an uh, optic it'll have an acceptance angle where you can see the solar cell, or in this case, uh, outside the water. Uh, and obviously at certain angles, it'll stop working. And obviously the uh, surface quality, so if it's smooth or wrinkled, that'll all have an effect on the actual um, optical efficiency. Uh, and this picture here is of a, a low concentration optic. And it's a pretty bad one because it's uh, been made uh, with a, not a very smooth surface, so you can see all this cloudiness in the walls. So ideally you would actually see this one centimetre squared cell repeated all through the optic walls, showing that the reflection was working and uh, all the light was hitting the cell. Um, and you can also see there's like bubbles and things as well, which obviously don't help. Uh, yeah, so my research. Um, there's a few things that I'm involved in. Um, one of the th repeating themes in all of the research seems to be reducing the weight of uh, the solar concentrator, the system. Uh, so I mentioned about integrating into buildings, and obviously to do that, especially if you're using glass optics, uh, you want to reduce the weight. They can't be very heavy. Uh, if you reduce the weight, then you can reduce the cost of transport and installation, and it's easier to install, but also you just increase the application. So uh, some structures have weight limits, uh, so this would benefit that. Um, I do a lot of, uh, so for example, that's uh, a solar window, which I'll describe next. Um, but uh, yeah, this this is a ray trace image. So I do a lot of um, designing of optics and simulation software, and then we trace the rays and we see how efficiently the uh, rays can be directed onto a small area and with that we can play around with the effects of uh, sun angle uh, and uh, rough surfaces or poorly made optics to see how the, how the design is going to really perform outside. Um, and then I also, so uh, I try to do all of the parts of the solar concentrator, so the design, uh, the manufacturing and the testing. Uh, so that you can kind of get a good idea of what's going to get made well and what's not going to be made well. Uh, and it's to do... Uh, so again, another theme that seems to be through my research is the surface quality, the surface structure. And that's where we get into kind of uh, nanostructures, which obviously have an effect on optics and can be done, can do some pretty cool things. Um, yeah, so 
to describe in a bit of detail, um, this is a project I work on called EIPB, which just stands for Embedded Systems for Integrated Photovoltaics. Um, so what we did was we designed a solar window. Uh, so this uh, uses a low concentration optic, uh, as I described before. And the main challenge of this was actually to make it out of plastic instead of glass. So to reduce the weight, because obviously if all of these optics were made of glass, it would be a very heavy window. Uh, this is about uh, 60 centimetres by 60 centimetres, this window. Um, and you can see in this picture the solar cell with the light uh, focusing onto the edges. Um, so this was working with uh, people in China where... That's uh, yeah, so this is working with people in China because they... Uh, really want to be able to utilise vertical walls. So they've got a lot of uh, uh, very tall buildings with them um, uh, that they could utilise if they were able to put solar windows in them. Uh, but for the UK, we would probably have them more on the roof. Uh, oh, sorry, well, we would have, we'd have them both, but more on the roof because we don't have as much of that uh, skyscraper and compactness. Um, but... Uh, Where's my mouse? Here it is. Um, yeah, so the idea is you've got uh, front glass, a uh, light goes through, you've got CCPC optic. Uh, CCPC just means cross compound parabolic concentrator. So that just means it's uh, CPC but square, essentially. Um, and then you have solar cell, and then you've got the, the back pane of glass. And uh, there's a few things that we wanted to do with this type of design. We wanted it to be as thin as a standard uh, double glazed window uh, and have all the same effects. So be say vacuum sealed or argon gas injected, so you've still got the thermal properties. But the advantage is that you get a little bit of electricity. Uh, and this would be mainly for say offices or um, buildings that visually it isn't important seeing it. Um, but in theory you could uh, play around with the spacing to get whatever effect you want for your specific application. Um, and yeah, so the UK has a lower um, sun than China. China's got a very high sun in the summer. Uh, so because of that, and because they want vertical installations mainly, uh, we designed this uh, 2D version of the optic uh, to go in the walls. So that's just so that it accepts the light from the sun. So there's lots of things you have to take into consideration when you're designing solar concentrators. And sometimes one of them is just where it's actually going to go. Um, so you can design something that works very well, uh, but then in a certain location, uh, with a certain orientation, it would perform rubbish. Um, so yeah, so we designed this 2D uh, equivalent, which uh, has an asymmetric profile. So it's kind of uh, shallower on one side of the optic and steeper on the other. And that just means that the light coming in at the sharper angles still get to the solar cell. And there's some images of it there. Um, yeah, so the, the results of the plastic optics in comparison to the glass, I mean, as you would expect, the, the plastic optics, uh, specifically topaz, was what we found to be the best performing. Um, plastic optics have a, a lower transparency. Um, but about half the weight. So overall, uh, for the topaz optic, which was this red one, um, it was uh, about double power to weight ratio of glass, which is the blue one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we thought that was really good. And interestingly enough, the power to weight ratio of the plastic topaz optic, oh, and the, the um, these little, uh, lighter shaded areas are AR coated optics. So that was just to show that mm, the plastic optics seem to benefit a little bit more from the AR coatings. Uh, you could say that's probably because uh, the surface of plastic optics is a bit rougher than the surface of glass. So it um, benefits a bit more from an AR coating. Uh, but yeah, so the, the plastic topaz optic. Uh, had a, had the highest power to weight ratio, um, and it was 
comparable or even slightly better than the standard, our standard silicon prototype we made. Um, I guess in theory that's possible uh, because the plastic's so lightweight but adds so much more energy. Uh, so yeah, the other research I do is uh, biomimicry. So I've talked a little bit about the surface quality of optics and that's led into the surface roughness and nanostructures and uh, actually designing surface structures so that it helps the light either entering an optic or reflecting or doing some kind of filtering for example. Um, and so at the University of Exeter uh, I'm part of the environment and in, in the Environment and Sustainability Institute uh, and that one of the main aims of that institute is to increase inter interdisciplinary research. So uh, I started work with some researchers there that study this uh, cabbage white butterfly, is what this is called. Uh, you have them in Australia as well as the UK and most places in the world, I think. Um, but the main difference with this uh, butterfly is that it uh, basks in the sun and with its wings in a V-shape. So very similar to uh, a solar concentrator. Uh, so the, the butterfly, um, it does this because it gets more light energy onto its uh, body and it needs to uh, heat up flight muscles for it flies. So that's its reason. Uh, but we looked at trying to copy it for solar cells. So the structure specifically and its light weightness. Uh, because uh, insect wings in general are very, <coughs> they're very lightweight but they're also very strong. So you have uh, kind of these rigid lines that go through them that helps their stability. Um, so here we've got uh, an IR image of essentially a solar cell with uh, wings flat and then wings in a V-shape, uh, just showing how much the uh, temperature increases. And then uh, in terms of electricity, so you've got a standard one centimetre by one centimetre solar cell. Uh, power output, uh, current and voltage, and then with the, the wings that we had, uh, increased it, and, but obviously still not as good as standard reflective film. But again, with this research, it was about the power to weight ratio. So the power to weight ratio was uh, a ridiculous kind of 17 times more because the wings are just so much more uh, lightweight than anything uh, metallic. Um, <coughs> so we found this was due to mainly due to the um, the structure of the wings, uh, and mainly just the top structure as well. So there are layers as in, in the wings, but it was really just the top structure that had the effect uh, that you could take away and use on a very thin layer, uh, which we also tested. Um, but yeah, so this is a a reflectance map of the wing. Uh, the blue dot uh, corresponds to black spot with uh, uh, with less of these beads. So that's what the structure looks like. And then the uh, darker reds uh, and the light pink is where it's the highest reflectance. Um, but yeah, this was we looked at the reflectance just to check what wavelengths it was actually reflecting and if that matched well with uh, silicon solar cells which we were using. Um, and we saw that it had a, a very high reflectance of above 80%, uh, probably a little bit more if uh, it was handled uh, more gently. But um, yeah, this corresponded really well with uh, the solar cell acceptance range. So silicon usually absorbs between 350 to 1100. Um, and uh, these beads in specifically are the, what the, the kind of main responsible thing here that reflect that light. So this structure is uh, responsible more for this area. So um, yeah, we're hoping to kind of biomimic this structure to make very lightweight uh, reflective materials. Um, I, like I said before, we'd probably have to use these kind of rigid uh, ladder-like structures that help keep the material uh, stable or strong, strong enough at least. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that I kind of have gotten into recently is um, uh, the aesthetics of solar technology. So uh, usually whenever people come and ask me to work with them, I always say yes. 
uh, and so someone came and asked me to help with uh, an art project, but not a student art project, a quite a big kind of funded art project. Uh, and they're looking at trying to make art, solar artwork, but using solar cells so that it also produces electricity. Uh, and one of the things that they wanted to do, and I, I very much agree with, is, um, is uh, changing the viewpoint of solar technology. So a lot of people, um, they kind of think, they still think of it as energy is quite a kind of boring subject. It's a utility, it's not really a, a thing that they indulge in, uh, like art. Um, so, yeah, I was just trying to break this idea that a solar panel has to be a blue square um, and instead has a lot of options. And the concentrator photovoltaics in particular has lots of design potential possibly uh, because you've got luminescent concentrators and you've got different shapes uh, and you can be a bit more flexible with your how you actually design or attach it to a building or depending on the application. Um, yeah. So, but the disadvantages of CPV. So in comparison to silicon PV, uh, so silicon PV is always falling in cost, which is great. Um, it's very, very good. Uh, but it means that CPV has a hard time competing, obviously. Uh, and some of the projections are always, uh, always saying that CPV will catch up with PV. Um, but usually, well, in the past, as soon as a CPV hits some kind of breakthrough in, in cost reductions, PV has also hit a breakthrough in cost reductions, so it hasn't quite ever caught up. Um, and um, there's one thing to catch up with it, but then be better at, uh, than PV is another thing. Um, and because it relies on PV, uh, you could argue maybe that wouldn't happen. Um, but I would say that the other advantages of CPV are worth uh, focusing on instead. So CPVs are more efficient, um, so they, least, they need less space, which for uh, applications where you're limited to space, they'll always produce more power. Um, uh, so that's a diagram there of kind of a thin film PV output over the uh, fixed silicon panel a tracking silicon panel and then a tracking CVV uh, con um, technology. It doesn't have their stationary CPV, but um, it would still be higher than the, the silicon as long as, as long as everything worked properly. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and um, uh, one of the other aspects is uh, it's technically a, a little bit well, I suppose you could argue it's a bit more eco-friendly because it uses less PV material, but I guess it would depend uh, specifically on what solar technology you're using. Uh, so some very high efficiency multi-junction solar cells uh, are quite uh, intensive in the mining uh, of the materials, but you do only use, say, well, it's, you know, it could be 1% of a system in terms of the space. Um, so that's worth considering. Uh, and then also the aesthetics, so uh, CPV is definitely more flexible for uh, applications and integration into buildings and things, so yeah. So um, like I said before, uh, you can do glass uh, optics and, and windows uh, and achieve both electricity and light. Uh, and you can also have luminescent solar concentrators, which do similar. And these, um, this, so this is a picture of a greenhouse. And I think um, the uh, luminescent windows uh, help with some kind of filtering as well to help the type of wavelengths that the plants require. Um, so there's, there's a lot more um, customised kind of applications that can really benefit from careful design. Um, in terms of CPV progress, so uh, this is a graph I made mm, probably a few years ago now uh, when I was doing a literature review. Uh, but it has uh, the kind of progress of CPV. So you have your parabolic mirrors were the first uh, concentrators designed uh, way back when. 
Uh, and then Fresnel lenses were uh, designed for uh, used for lighthouses first. And these are made of glass. So they're very large uh, and still quite heavy, even though they were truncated down to be thin. Um, but um, CPV, the Fresnel lenses being used for CPV didn't actually uh, happen properly until um, the, about more than 100 years later um, uh, with the discovery of PMMA. So this lighter material uh, combined with this um, lighter, more practical structure is what then spurred on a lot of CPV research, uh, especially into Fresnel lenses, but also in general. Uh, so it's from that point onwards where CPV research starts getting a lot more attention. Um, and uh, in recent years, we've seen more kind of segmentation of optics and more design of low concentration optics, um, which have all kind of been pushing higher and higher concentration ratios. Um, but uh, so that's that's kind of the the PMMA Fresnel lenses is kind of a good justification of tri for trying to uh, not only come up with more do novel designs but also more novel materials that kind of complement those designs uh, and reduce the weight and improve the practicality of the optics. So, um, because I mean the, the Fresnel lens wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, a massive break breakthrough in efficiency say, it was more the practicality that helped uh, the CPV research. So uh, there's probably a lot of scope I, st I think still for uh, kind of clever but effective designs with materials for for application rather than just pushing the efficiency up. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, uh, from and, and, uh, so for CPV technology, um, it probably has to get, it probably has to be as thin as solar panels for the practical installations in comparison. Um, and these days there are micro concentrators, so everything I've described now, they've started making them much smaller with much smaller solar cells, so they can be as, as thin as uh, a standard solar panel. Uh, I think building integrated uh, CPV as well as kind of limited space applications is where CPV would has the main advantage, really. Um, and as I said before, in terms of the actual optics, uh, segmented optics, so Fresnel lens <coughs> and similar, uh, they always seem to perform a bit better than just a continuous curve, uh, continuous curved optic, um, which then kind of allows maybe a bit more interesting designs and manufacturing such as uh, 3D printing. Um, uh, but most importantly, I think uh, definitely need to always consider the application and the location of the the technology or the design, um, because that's where you can really take advantage or um, avoid uh, low efficiencies. Um, yeah, so the the research that we hopefully will do here is uh, looking at so beam steering, so uh, the idea of solar panel or CPV panel, uh, and have something on top which allows uh, light from all different angles throughout the day, from the sun to uh, get adjusted to be normal incidence, so straight line incidence onto the, the solar panel, uh, and that way increasing the performance throughout the day. Um, and this uh, this layer might need. Uh, well, we're thinking about three D printing the layer for uh, complex designs and high resolution. Um, so these are some images of kind of the, the 3D printing capable these days. Um, so one of the things I'd be interested in is uh, printing layers of different refractive index. So different layers of refractive index can have the uh, curving property that would be needed. Uh, and it could have anti-reflective properties if you layer it from low to high, from air to glass. Um, uh, and it's also fairly novel. And um, also shrinking 3D printed uh, optics down to improve the resolution. Uh, so those are kind of the two main ideas we're, we're thinking about. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing 
that hopefully we could do is um, find out if it's possible to uh, combine perovskite solar cells with uh, CPV optics. And it's not really been done before, but um, I think I have more information here. Um, but um, perovskites, uh, so the, the main disadvantage of perovskites is their degradation. Um, but you can have filters and luminescent concentrators and downshifting materials, for example, uh, could protect uh, perovskites from the UV part of the wavelength. And if you're going to have filters, you might as well have a concentrating optic that has that filter in it. So you have you a bit more energy coming out as well as the filtering of the UV away. Uh, and obviously with the attachment of optics, you would obviously have uh, a ceiling anyway, which is very important for perovskites so that they're protected from the air and the moisture. Um, yeah, so that's hopefully another thing that could potentially be uh, be instigated, uh, as perovskites are very um, attractive at the moment. Um, yeah, and that's everything. Thanks. <laughs>
I don't think there's a clear image of, uh, yeah. So these sore cells are actually from uh, Teal Sun in China. And they are the exact same material and layering of their standard 15 centimeters or 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters silicon cells that they use in panels. Uh, what we did is we designed a metallization pattern. So they put more lines on them, essentially. Uh, you can see them, I think, in this image. Yeah. So they put more lines on them and a uh, bus bar connection uh, and patterned that so that they could be one centimeter by one centimeter squared and then cut them to the size that we wanted. Uh, but so there's wires in there that connect, like you have little blocks there, and those sort uh, of So the blocks cells are just connected. Uh, positive to negative with one tabbing wire. There's no like other. How many in series and parallel? Uh, so for this big window, uh, we did each row in series and then in parallel. Does that make sense? So this cell is in series connection to this cell, but it's parallel connection to this cell. So by row in terms of parallel. Um, but you could, I mean, if you have an automated system, you could do whichever, whichever you prefer, I guess, if you're confident in the connections. This is done in-house, so that's why we did it row by row, uh, in case anything went wrong with one of the rows. Um, but yeah, so uh, that, that system there, that uh, 60 centimetre by 60 centimetre one has about <coughs> It's got 26 cells by 26 cells. Uh, yeah, so a lot of cells that had to be connected. <laughs> All right, um, if there's no more questions now, maybe you guys uh, may think of some later. She'll, she'll be around for a few more weeks if, if anybody wants to collaborate. And uh, other than that, thanks a lot. Yeah.